But so I'm going to open up in a word of prayer before I get started. So, Lord, we just thank you, God, for tonight. We thank you for just bringing us here to this place to just be together in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in each and every one of us. And we pray that you just have your way in us tonight, Lord. Amen. So I'm going to be in two different books. So the first book I'm going to be in is 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm sure we're all familiar with 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> so what I'm going to be kind of talking about today is love. And he's been kind of impressing love on me for the last few weeks. And for me, it was kind of, you know, asking that question, okay, well, why love? And so as I kind of started digging into this, you know, um, I'll read verses 1 through 7 first, and then I'll kind of jump into it. So in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, it says, If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag, and it is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, that's a whole lot packed into just seven verses. And when you look at it, the kind of bottom line of love is it's sacrificial. Love is sacrificial. Love is not about how you feel, what you want what is good for you, what benefits you. It is what is beneficial for whoever it is that you're loving, right? So if we're married, we have um, kids, we have family, um, siblings, you know, brothers and, you know, all the good stuff. If we love that person, like truly love that person and they need something, I mean, we're going to do it, right? Even if it means that we have to give something up for ourselves. I mean, okay, like my sister, for example, she loves like all the hot chips, right? And she will be begrudgingly share with me. She's gotten a lot better, but she will be like, do you want one? She'll give me that face and like, okay, I'm not going to see which one you get. Because if you get one that I like, I'm going to be mad at you. And she sacrifices some of her chips because she knows I like them too. So for her, that's sacrificial. And we all have things that we sacrifice sacrifice for the people that we love because we almost anything and everything we do is out of love the way that um okay like husbands most of the time they're gonna tell you I do not want to go to work like my husband he tells me he's like do you think I go to work for myself I'm like well kind of yeah like I mean you have you kind of have to go right he's all no I don't he's like but I have a family he's like and I choose to go to work for you guys and it's like, well, okay, like, I never thought about it like that. I'm just like, well, you go to work, it's what you do. But for him, that's his sacrificial thing for us is, you no, know, I have a family I love. I have a family I want to provide for. So no matter how much I might not like my job, no matter how much it sucks being out there in 100 plus heat, doing physical manual labor, breaking myself, I'm going to go and do it because I have a family that I love and I want to care for. And if we look at examples from the Bible, Jesus is a good example. Do you think Jesus wanted to go and die on that cross? No. He literally had begged in the garden, Lord, if this cup can pass me by, but not my will, let yours be done. So he went on that cross and died for us because why? Love. We look at Abraham and Isaac, right? God asked Abraham to sacrifice his promised son. Right? I'm going to give you a son. He gave him his son in his old age. Okay, now, Abraham, take that son and go sacrifice him up. Offer him as a sacrifice to me. What? I Hold on, Lord. You, you promised me the son. You fulfilled this promise just for to ask me to sacrifice him to you? And yet, all the less, Abraham was willing to do that. Why? Because of love. For us. 
when we obey, we don't obey because we want to most of the time, right? Because there's some things that God asks us to do and we're like, Lord, are you sure? I don't want to do that. And yet when we finally come to that place of surrender, okay, God, not my will, but yours. Why do we do it? Love. But who is this love to? And all three of these examples, the love is not to self. The love is not to one another, but the love is to God. The love is to the Father. We do it because we love him. We want to please him. We want to do what it is that he's asking us to do. You know, the same way that, you know, sometimes children want to please their parents, right? So, okay, well, I want mom and dad to be happy and be proud. I'm going to do this because I know they like this. I'll help them out with this because I know they need that or they like when I do that. It's the same thing. We do it out of love. Anything and everything we do is almost, almost always out of love. And like it says, God expects us to do all things in love or it counts for nothing. I mean, it tells us right here, if we do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Like if I was to look at my life and if I was to be like, okay, oh, I do all of, the, all of these things out of love, you know, I care for my kids. I, make, I try to make sure, you know, they're um, eating good three meals a day because, you know, my toddler doesn't like to eat good three meals. She just likes to snack and junk food. But if I look at all the things I think I do out of love for my family and for others and for the kingdom, I have to look at it as, will it actually be me doing my actions or all the things I think I do out of love? When I'm doing them, will they be clinging symbols? Like for me, that's a visual I have to give myself. Okay, well, I'm doing this because I love them. Okay, but am I actually doing out of love or am I just a noisy gong? And it's like thinking about it like that, it's like, ooh, I might be making noise all day then, okay? Because, yeah, I do things because I love the person, but does not mean that I do it out of love because there's a huge difference. You know, we can go about all day, you know, like I used to be mad at God for so many reasons that I can't remember now. But it's like, oh, I'm doing this because you asked me to. And for me, it was sacrifice. I was sacrificing the things that I wanted because, well, you asked me to do it. Versus he asked me to do something and I willingly did it because I loved him and I truly wanted to obey him. Then it did not feel like a sacrifice. Then it was just like, okay, God, whatever, whatever you want to do, I'm going to do it versus when I was all mad and angry and sacrificing. I was the noisy gong because whatever I was doing, even though technically it was what he asked, he was like, what is that? That, that counts as nothing to me because you're not doing it out of love. And for me, I'm just like, in my mind, I think I am. Well, I gave up what I wanted to do what you wanted. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. And I mean, I had to learn that the hard way, but it's like now it's like, dang, you know, looking back, it's like, wow, I was making a whole lot of noise. Still am, just not as much. And then in our workbook on page 87, I know most most of you guys don't have it with you. I know we're all in the Bible study together. But um, if you were going to go back and look, it says this. A church with members who argue and fail to demonstrate love to one another does not appear to a lost world as if it has something to offer. Now, when I had read that, it had stuck out to me so much because it's true. If you ask people who were believers and then they decided to not, you know, to go back to the world and the main thing you ask them all, you know, why, what happened? What changed? Oh, well, I was hurt. I got church hurt. And it's like, okay, but why did you turn away from God? Right? Because God and people are two different things. We can be Christians, but it does not mean that we are good Christians. Okay? We can come to church. We can do all the things. But it does not mean that we were actually embodying Christ. Because what he showed me is that oftentimes churches are too busy passing judgment. And sometimes now they went the complete opposite where they're accepting everything. Like, oh, anybody and everybody can um, go to heaven, whether you're saved or not, no matter, you know, what you're doing, whatever the case is. But that we do not appear to have love, right? If we're too busy passing judgment, we don't appear to have love. 
So if you look at people and you always see them talking about people and criticizing them and they should do this and they should do that, you're probably going to avoid those people because you're like, well, if they're talking about them, they're going to talk about me. And you look at certain people and like church people, we can sometimes, depending, have the tendency to try to shove God down somebody's throat, right? Quote the scriptures and do all this and do all that. And the reality is, is that it's turning people away. And they're like, like, I don't want to hear that. Like, I've, I've been there, done that. I've heard all that. Like, where's the love? Where's the love? Because if you want to turn to James chapter 3, um, I'll be there, be reading in that one next. So in James chapter 3, I'll be reading verses 5 through 10. And so it says, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. And it is set on fire by how? For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord, our Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. When I read that, it's like, dang, (laughs) how true is that for me? You know, I could be on my way to church. You know, okay, cool, we're going to church. Somebody cuts me off in the road and I'm over here cursing this person. You need to get out of the way. You need to learn how to drive better, you know. And then I'm here singing praise and worship to the Lord, right, five minutes later. And it's like, that's crazy because it's true. Like, how often in our own personal lives do we get mad or, like, on the, like, in a split second, like, we're just, we're cursing at something or we're getting mad and we're, like, saying all these things and just going off in a rage about whatever we're mad about. And the next thing, oh, God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. And it's like, it's crazy because of how true that can be. Like, I know in my life, it's like, man, that's true. Like, one minute, I'm like all mad and telling the person they need to be a better driver. And the next time I'm over here, hi, I'm doing good. How are you? And it's like, it tells us, though, like, the tongue is poisonous. You know, it has the, it has the, um, the power to speak life or death over anything. Because anytime we speak, we think about it. We speak out in anger. Let's say, okay, for example, in relationships. You speak out in anger because you're hurt or somebody just made you mad. And you say something cutting because, well, you're angry. What does it do to that relationship? Whether it's um, your mom, dad, brother, sister, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your spouse. It can kill off whatever is there. Because in a split second... I know for me, in my marriage, there have been times, especially in the beginning, right? The beginning is always like the hardest when you're living together, all these different changes. And it's like, I remember the beginning of my marriage, we would get in arguments, fights, right? But then we'd be mad. And in a split second, we would both say something. And then the next time we're like, dang. In a split second, you say something you can't take back. And then it causes hurt. It causes resentment. It causes all these things that build up when if you can control your tongue, that never would have happened in the first place. But it tells us that the tongue is the one thing that cannot be controlled. We can't tame it, right? In our own personal, on our own personal um, strength, we can't tame it. Now, that's when the Holy Spirit comes in and helps us. Because, Lord, like, I'm, like my mom says, you know, hold me back. And it's true. Like, you have to have, that's nothing but the Holy Spirit to hold that tongue. Because sometimes we do want to just snap. We want to bite. But it's not it's not the best option because like we were talking about, you know, people can look at us and be like, well, they don't love one another. What do they have to offer me? I've been church her. I've been this. I've been that. And it's like most of it has to do where like where we come from, where we're saying what we're talking about, what we're giving off. Because, yeah, a lot of people can pass off judgment and, you know. There's a time and a place for everything. There's a time and a place for rebuke. There's a time and a place to correct, to encourage. 
to lift one another up, to pray. There's a time for anything and everything. To correct somebody, it's not wrong. But it has to be in the right context. It has to come from the Word, not just your own opinion, not just what you think the Bible is saying, but just genuinely the Word. This is what the Word says. And sometimes that's all you have to do, is literally give somebody a scripture, and that can be just as correcting and just as rebuking. But because it's the Word, it's never going to come back void. So it's not like, oh, well, you hurt me because you said this. No, I just gave you God. I gave you God and that's it. Like if you're feeling, you know, rebuked and corrected, take it up with God. Now, if I throw my own personal opinions in there, okay, now you can come at me because I, that was my own doing. I gave you something besides just God. And the most important thing is that in all those things, we have to do it in love. Because if we look at Jesus, right, when he was here on earth, he rebuked, he corrected, he lifted up, he encouraged, he prayed with his people. But it wasn't because he's like, oh, well, I'm God. He did it because he knew he had a purpose here on earth and he was here to fulfill that purpose. He was here to bring people to God, but he did it out of love. Anything and everything Jesus did was out of love. No matter whether it was a rebuke, or encouraging somebody, it was out of the love. Because for us, you know, we're human. We have flesh. We can, you know, be snappy. We can say things we don't mean. Um, or we can just want to cut and jab at people just because, well, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. But one wrong word from us can cause somebody to run from Christ. You can have one conversation, say one sentence to somebody, and they can take it the complete opposite of what you're intending, or they can take it straight at face value for what it is you're telling them. And from that one single conversation, that can make them be like, you know what? If that's what Christ is, I'm good. I don't want it. And how often, maybe I know some of you personally probably have experienced that, where you know you were a lost person in the world. You're wanting something. You're reaching for something. You're like, man, this is pulling me. What is it? I want that. And you, you express that want to somebody who's a Christian. And then they tell you, oh, well, you're doing this and you're doing that and you're wrong for this and you're wrong for that. Oh, well, if that's what that is, nah, I'm cool. I'll keep living my life if, if you're just going to judge me like everybody else in the world is judging me. If we're going to act like that, we are not embodying Christ, right? We want people to come, right? We want people to get saved. We want to build the kingdom. We can't build a kingdom if we're not building in love first. That's just, the, that's just the pure, that's just the bottom line, right? If everything we do is out of love, we have to learn love. And it's not only our words that get people. It's our actions. Because we can be a whole lot of good talk. Especially those of us who have been around in church for a while. I'm one who grew up in church. I know how to walk the walk. I know how to talk the talk. My face may give me away sometimes, okay? Right? But for the most part, I know what to say. I know how to act. I know how to behave because I grew up around it. I know what it's like, you know, for all the people to do the church talk and the church walk. But if my actions are saying something different, well, it means nothing. Because somebody out in the world is going to pick me apart like that. They look just like me. You see them outside Sunday after church? You see what they're doing? Right? It's like if my actions don't match my words, it's still the same. It counts for nothing. And we see here, it's like, you know, the tongue, it has power to speak life or death over our situations. So we look at our own personal lives. You know, we can be going through trials, tribulations. And what we speak, is that going to hold? It's like, are we speaking life? Or are we speaking death? over our own trials and tribulations. Okay, for me, for example, you know, I'm just having a lot of um, anxiety and, you know, all this, like, weird stuff. I can't even explain it. But I feel like something trying to drag me down. And I'm emotional, and I'm like, God, I don't know what's going on, and this and that. And then when he said this, are you going to speak life, or are you going to speak death over your circumstance? And in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, what do you mean? He's like, okay, 
you can either say, you know what, God, you have the victory. God, this battle is yours. God, I know that you have me. God, I know that you're walking with me. God, I know that you're before me, behind me, beside me. Or is he like, man, God, you're nowhere to be found. The devil is on my back. He's winning. He's dragging me down. I can't do this. This is so hard. Well, what's the difference between the two? Right? One, God is life. God, I'm speaking life over this. I'm bringing you into this because you're all I have. Versus the other, well, you're just laying down for the enemy to kick you and he'll kick you when you're down, okay? He don't care. And it's like, which one, which one are we doing? In our personal lives, that's our own choice. But if we're going to come into church and we're going to sit here and say, you know, we want the kingdom to grow. We want to have people come. Are we speaking life? Are we speaking death over the kingdom of God? Are we sitting here praying, Lord, I know you can do this. Lord, I know you can bring people. God, change me so we can bring in the people, right? Because they're looking at us. If we're not showing love to one another, we're all looking at each other at the corner of our eyes like, oh, I can't wait to leave church. So I don't have to be around this brother or sister anymore. Like people pick up on that. And if we're doing that, that oh, they got nothing to offer me. They're just like me. It's like, so are we speaking life over our own church? Are we speaking life over pastor and his wife? Are we praying for them? Are we interceding for them? It's like, we can't say we want the kingdom of God to grow, and yet we're speaking death over it. Man, you know, so-and-so showed up, and then now they haven't been here for a couple weeks. I wonder what happened. And no follow-through. Crickets. And it's like, um, okay. You know, it's like, oh, we want more visitors. Let's do all these events and this and that. Yeah, events can bring in people for the moment. But you know who brings in people for the long run? Us. But not because of us. Because we are embodying Christ. We embody Christ. Christ is the one who draws them in. Christ is the one who keeps them. Because if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, if we're not being the body men of Christ, we're nothing. We are nothing because that means we are not doing what we do in love. What we're saying we want to do, we're not doing it in love. I want to go outreach. I want to go reach the nations. And I'm sitting here doing nothing. I may pray about it. Oh, God, please bring in people. And that's it. I'm not interceding. I'm not praying. I'm not fasting. I'm not going out there and ministering. I'm not going out there and trying to reach the people. It's just a nice thought in my head. And it's like, you know, trying to reach people to win Christ or to try to have people be won over to Christ. A common factor that I have seen or have heard, you know, from people talking is that they don't care about what you look like. They don't care about, you know, how you preach, how you teach. They look at you as a person. And they look at if you care about them. They say, who is there for me when I need them? Who is the one reaching out to me? Who is the one that shows me love? And it's not pushing God. It's not speaking about God all the time. It's not trying to just throw yourselves at them. It's just having a genuine care for them. Like, they notice that, like, okay, this person is genuinely reaching out to me. Okay, well, why are they reaching out to me? Is it just because they want me to go to their church? Or are they actually genuinely caring about how I'm feeling, about what I'm going through, what am I, what I'm experiencing, what I may need help with? Okay, well, they seem like they care. They keep reaching out. They keep checking up on me. Hm, this person seems to love me. And now you have established that relationship of love then comes the opportunity to speak. Then comes the opportunity to share Christ. Like we even have read it in the workbook, you know, stories, the same thing. You know, people who are opposed to Christ and, oh, they're Christians. Okay, well, maybe don't talk to me about Christ. Uh, I don't care about him. I want nothing to do with him. Okay, well, you know what? That's fine. I'll just be here. I'll be a friend. If you need anything, just let me know. Hey, man, how are you doing? How's this going? How's that going? And eventually they come to a point in their lives where they're desperate. They know they need something more. Hey, where's that Christian friend at? Where is he at? 
hey man, how are you doing? Oh, hey, I was just thinking about you. I'm going, I'm struggling. I need help. Oh yeah, man, I can, I can lead you in prayer. Okay, please. It's like establishing that relationship of love is what brings people to Christ. Saved, unsaved. Hold on, I need some water. And what he showed me is, you know, in this thing, we do that. It's first, it's love first, speak second. And I think in my life, how many times have I just spoke first? Right? Even, with, even within friendships. You know, you have an established friendship with somebody, but they're not Christian. And you feel like you have the free the ability to speak freely, which you should. I mean, you're in a friendship, right? But it doesn't mean that they're always ready to receive it. And it's like, I know my own personal friendships, right? I've had people that weren't Christian. They respected me for being a Christian. But when it came time to, like, talk about it, it was always arguing or, you know, well, what about this and what about that? And they just weren't open to receiving it. And maybe that's because I didn't show them that love that they needed to be shown for them to actually become genuinely intrigued and wanting to listen and wanting to know more about Christ and coming to church and be like, well, let me see what this is about. Because they admit that they did see me to be a true Christian because they've seen me go through trials. They see me face temptations and they themselves are putting temptations in my face and still like, nope, um, I'm a Christian. I cannot do that. Like, I strongly believe in this. Okay, I respect you. Like, you have proven yourself to me. But was I actually embodying Christ enough for them to be intrigued? No. I was still in my own little world, my own little thing, doing what I thought worked. But obviously it didn't. And so in order to do all of this, I first need to learn to love. Or I first need to learn love to be love. Like when he spoke that to me, because I had asked him a few, like a few weeks ago, what about love? Like, do I need to learn it? Do I need to be alive? Do I need it? Like, what is it? And then he said, you need to learn love to be love. I got a lot of learning to do because we we all went through those verses. Love is a lot of things and it's not about self. It is not about me. And so when he says that, learn love to be love. Who is love? What is love? Christ. Christ is love. You look at his life. It is love. You look at what he's done for us. It is love. And when all things are done in love, God receives it. And for me, it's like, I want to be received. I don't want to be sitting, you know, in the wilderness for the 40 years, like a clinging symbol, thinking I'm doing all these things, thinking I'm doing, you know, okay, God, he asked me to do this. And he's like, no, you're not doing it in love. Like, you're just a clinging symbol to me. It's like, I don't want to do that. And I want to learn more about Christ so that I can be like Christ because Christ brought people to the father through rebukes, through um, corrections, through encouraging and lifting up and all these things that he did. It was out of love. Not one thing that Jesus did was not for the worst or for the detriment of the other person. It was always for the edification of somebody. And I want to be that Christian where somebody can look at me, look at my life and say, you know what? They do embody Christ. They are different because they embody Christ. Because all Christians can look the same. We can all do the same things, talk the same talk, walk the same walk. But are we all truly embodying Christ and who he is and what he expects from us? And so I want to just encourage everybody to speak life over our church, to speak life over your own personal circumstances. Because I know for me, we have the tendency to speak death. We speak negativity over everything. And just to continue just to pursue God, to push in, to press in, and just to continue to dig into the word. 
so that we can just show each other that true love, that Christ-like love unto one another.